So what we're going to be doing is bringing technologists and leadership from across the Army to come talk about what their upcoming priorities are and what's the best way for small businesses to get involved with them, whether you've done it before or whether you're brand new and just getting involved in the space. Um, our panelists include Brian Halloran. He's AAL's Solution and Innovation Team Lead. Uh, Matt Willis, Director of Army Prize Competitions and Army Applied Cyber Programs. Chad Nash, he's Deputy Product Manager and Technical Director for PNT Modernization. Um, and Stephen Hart, Army Reserve Acquisition Officer with the 75th Innovation Command. Gentlemen, welcome. Good morning. Good Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. How are we doing? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Outstanding. Good to see the team out there in cyberspace. Um, nice to meet you. I'm Brian Haller, and I uh, was elected moderator of this illustrious group. And you might uh, ask how I got that honor. Um, when you schedule the first prep, when at a time where you are not there, you get elected the moderator. <laughs> so the good news is that's my job. The bad news is, as I've been told, sometimes I'm not as funny and entertaining as I may think I am. So, but before we get started. I'd like to thank the Cap Factory for this great event, the staff and Josh and the team. Thank you very much. This has been first class for the entire operation, um, the sponsors, and our uh, Opportunity Knox coach, Jamie Dean, in the back, who got us all up to speed. Um, before we get started into the meat of what we really want to talk about, I'll just kind of lay out what we're going to go over. We'll each take about two minutes and go over kind of a priority area that the Army's looking at. Um, and we'll be quick, we will introduce ourselves, but you've read our bios and we don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, then we'll take, we want the meat of this to be about 15 minutes of questions from you all. Cause as we saw with General Todd and we saw in the last session, you know, you, you have a perspective that often we don't have from the government side and that's critical. And then for the last five minutes, we'll each take about a minute and talk about an upcoming event that we've got going on. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Chad. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, really glad to be here. Um, I'm out of Ab Aberdeen Proving Ground under uh, PMP and T. Uh, we have our 05, leader, 05 shop called PNT Modernization. Uh, really, the focus there is looking at that transition. How do we how do we navigate through? Uh, as we all know, that valley of uh, valley of death. Um, a lot of times, S and T does some great work, or there's a lot of a you know a lot of um, 6263 work that's going on. Um, how do we get that into our products? How do we align with our pre planned product improvement, really, um, to imp implement it into our programs of record? Uh, so, so that's really what we're looking at. We're looking at the disruptive technologies, uh, things that will really uh, save us in terms of cost or even performance, um, and also always get the soldier feedback. So, having the customer, the soldier uh, involved early on, are one of the key things that. Uh, we like work with industry on, um, especially uh, during this time as we're trying to do things innovative. Um, how do we contract? What are the means and mechanisms of doing that? And, in, and within that Aberdeen, we have what's called the uh, Open Innovation Lab. Uh, so it's an unclassified facility uh, which allows industry to come in um, and demonstrate their capabilities. And then we have all the stakeholders, uh, whether it's on the uh, lab, lab side, S&T side, um, or if it's a product management side. Uh, how do we incorporate uh, those capabilities uh, with with the vendors? We we look to work for it. We will look forward to working with everyone, and um, look forward to some good questions as well. All right, thank All right. you, and we'll move on to Matt if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, again. I'm Matt Willis. I'm the director for Army Prize Competitions and the Army Applied Cyber Program out of the office of the ASALT here in Washington, D.C. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is a, a pervasive topic. It's applicable across many different uh, domains within the Army. And in fact, you know, from a from a private sector perspective, you know, one of the things that the Army is really looking to do is, is tap into innovation and investments that are already happening independent of the Army that we can really leverage. So, for instance, within AIML, um, I'm sure everyone out there in the, in the audience is familiar with, uh, you know, this technology space, it's, uh, you know, rapidly expanding, you know, 20, 25 percent year over year annual uh, compound growth rate. So, Again, we're really looking uh, to not only adopt solutions that are happening in the private sector, but identify partners within the AIML space that can 
actually uh, see the Army as a viable strategic partner for technology development. So, you know, AIML, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a well, a, a short acronym, long, long term, but, you know, there's many different applications across the Army ecosystem from synthetic data generation to uh, natural language processing, image analysis, biometrics, uh, supply chain resilience, targeting, many, many different uh, potential applications for AI ML. And again, looking forward to, uh, you know, continuing to, to work with the small business innovation community on how, again, we can adopt all these great innovations that's happening in the private sector uh, to Army systems and Army use cases. Over. Matt, thanks for that great overview. Um, and we'll go to Steve and you pop back up on the screen. So good. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Great to be a part of this and really uh, appreciate industry and, and the Army getting together to help convey what, what we really need to do and what's important to uh, for the national defense of our country. So I, I work with the Army Acquisition Chief Technology Office and the Army Acquisition Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technology Office to do a variety of uh, of prototypes and pilots to discover and understand what the art of the possible is and what right looks like so that we can inform the next generation of investments and, and uh, rapidly develop equipment to, to get out to the field. Uh, as Matt mentioned, not only AI and ML, but uh, robotic autonomous systems are gonna play a big part in that. Uh, I'll speak a little bit more of that in the future. Right now we're focused on modular open system architectures so that we can plug and play sensors and and not be vendor locked or have uh, overly military specific solutions. Uh, some other things we'll work on, a modular again, and many of these projects with a uh, modular um, uh, autonomous air system that we can change out sensor units and, and uh, configure the device for different missions. Um, another modular area we're looking in is the uh, wearable technology to help, help us uh, detect and prevent illness and uh, getting that integration correct so soldiers don't end up with three devices on their wrist or they're on their bodies that are that are working for other purposes so there's a lot of uh, a lot of space right now in the uh, sensor fusion and uh, and big data how we how we can share data so uh, there are a lot of opportunities and I think that's right in the sweet spot for the uh, for many of our industry partners over no Steve thanks for that that's great. Um, so I'm Brian Halloran. I work uh, up on the eighth floor as part of the Army Applications Lab, which is part of AFC. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about energy and electrification. Um, I know, very specific topic, no broad areas there, but I will break it down to you in very t technical Army terms here. So take a deep breath. Are you ready? We're looking for stuff that they can power things that soldiers carry ride in, shoot, move, or drive, okay? Second bu bucket, stuff that powers everything I just mentioned, <laughs> either power storage or power generation. And the third one is stuff that can provide energy or electrification, power, whatever terms you wanna use for any post-camp installation, whether it be in the continental United States, anywhere else in the world, in a developed urban environment or a very austere environment. And if those three buckets were not broad enough for you, I will throw out a fourth that my boss has taught me lately. I'll call it the emerging opportunities bucket. If you think you got something that I didn't just cover, we'll put it in bucket four. Um, because there's a lot of development, a lot going on in this area. And we don't want to try to limit what you bring to the army and what we what we can take because sometimes we we tend to put the answer in the question and we tell you we want x and x was the coin of the realm like three years ago when i saw it when i was in some cool event like this but we didn't link back up until 36 months later so we want to get the cutting edge technology in operation in the dod in the military as soon as we can and i'll with that i think we will circle into questions and if uh if there's one in the room, we'll start off with that. If not, we'll go to the uh, cyberware. Excellent. Yeah, please raise your hand if you have a question. I have a microphone for you and I'm happy to bring it to you. Anyone? Anyone online with questions as well? Please feel free to put your questions now in the chat. Anyone be brave? First question? 
Sure. One second. Let me get you the mic. There you go. All yours. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you all for taking the time to come down here and for having all of us. Um, this question is for Mr. Willis. Uh, he mentioned AI, ML, and uh, natural language processing, specifically with respect to supply chain. So kind of curious what his thoughts and, and perhaps also the other panel members, what, what the thoughts are on, you know, just extracting data from whatever the, the use case may be, right? Whether it's uh, locked up in ERP systems, documents that you have out there, right? We're all swimming in paper still, even though we're in the digital age, right? Um, and, and what that means for predictive analytics. Thank you. Well, great. Yeah, no, I certainly appreciate that that question. And um, I mean, you're you're right. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, the army is a, a, a very complicated machine. There are many different systems. None of the systems talk well. Some of the systems talk to each other. But uh, you know, we're really interested again in how we can apply you know some of these next generation technologies to really not just evolutionize the way we do business, but really revolutionize it. And um, you know, supply chain management uh, or, you know, uh, sustainment management might not be the, the sexiest topic of the day, but it's absolutely important. And if you look at the curve in terms of uh, cost expenditures across the Army, sustainment is extremely uh, cost prohibitive. So anything we can do to inject innovation and drive efficiencies uh, is absolutely worthwhile. Are there any any other comments from the from the panel? Sure. 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 Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll, I'll say on the position navigation and timing side, right? Uh, where you are relative to to where you're fighting, um, it's a challenge with legacy systems. How do we do that? How do we incorporate sensor fusion um, on the battlefield? How do we incorporate such situa situa um, situational awareness um, in a dismounted form factor, right? So we have what else are we going to put on a soldier? Right. They're, they have a lot of kit already. So so how do we leverage what's existing? How do we leverage any of the sensors that are already available? Um, these systems are proprietary. Right. I, I think the baseline is really opening the architecture um, how, and, and that's the starting point. So so as you see the big pull for modular open systems architecture, um, both on mounted and dismounted applications, uh, we're looking to really leverage what industry has. Um, what open standards are available, using open standards, not a proprietary DOD specific type of uh, implementation, uh, really to, to leverage what's already out there. Steve, do you have any thoughts? Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, I do. Uh, we're currently doing a project to look at the combat training centers and the data, the rich data we're getting from these, uh, these training events. And up until this point, we really hadn't been able to extract that data and share it and store it in such a way that we're able to manipulate or understand the data. So I think a big part of that is understanding the use cases and curating the problem, identifying that stakeholder network that, where the data can be of, of most value. And then that helps us uh, iterate and getting to the right uh, algorithms or the right processes to, to really uh, make that rich data powerful for what we needed to do. Over. Thanks, team. And the only thing I'll throw out is I think most of the people in the room heard what, what Jim and uh, the RCV, the what is a cohort group talked about. But although the RCV sustainment cohort focuses on RCV as a test case and how you sustain uh, an unmanned system, it really feeds a broader question that the Army's got to deal with is there is huge desire for unmanned air and ground systems in the battlefield. There is significantly less desire to grow the amount of sustainers we have in the army or even frankly maintain the amount we have. Um, so this is a problem we're gonna have to enable what Matt talked about that goes right, directly to your question. In order to be successful, we've gotta crack this code and we've gotta solve this issue. Absolutely, thank you guys for answering the question. Thanks for asking thank it, the pressure's on everybody else. <laughs> Here, let me bring you the microphone one moment. All yours. Hey, uh, thanks everybody. Uh, just a quick question since we're on uh, MOSA. So um, I think one of the biggest challenges that uh, me and my team are seeing out in the world is we're uh, continuously talking about MOSA both in the Army, within uh, US SOCOM, uh, is that uh, there doesn't, I haven't seen much emphasis and I'm curious if the panel could, uh, could speak to how you're going to go about solving the problem of having a system that has a described API, a way to communicate with the system 
um, and has an open standard for interacting with the system, but a system that could be in fact proprietary at its core and how you're going to go about um, addressing that problem and winding up in potentially not the same spot that we are now, as you were describing, sir, with um, numerous proprietary systems that don't interact with each other, but may have an open standard that enables communication between them so that a vendor might potentially pack up their toys and go home and take your entire system with them, but still describe an open standard at the end of the day. Hopefully that made sense. That makes makes complete sense. Uh, I'm glad it made sense to you. Makes complete sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so we've and we interact directly, uh, you know, in terms of market research uh, in partnership with AAL, um, right? And a lot of things we get back. I'm an open system. Open system means that that you know that can mean a thousand different things to 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 each each person. So, how do we do that? We first start by try to uh, build a, that baseline, really, in terms of profiles. So, so the profiles are are, are where we're we're seeing um, the ability to really emphasize this is the data that we want. Right. And whether we have to build an adapter, there may be a plug in that we need to build, um, but it's a crawl, walk, run type of implementation. We're not, you know, right off the bat, it's it, there's a challenge there. Um, you know, we work with we work with the vendor. We work with each capability really um, on what open means and then how do we implement it in the system? It may first be in the form of a plug in. But the next step where really, um, the next iteration would be uh, focused on the data, data, data form factor, data. Um, transmission to the other system. So, so through standards like Victory, for example, um, at, the, at the networking layer, uh, we've seen that's kind of been the baseline um, on, the, on the ground application side um, for, for PNT anyway, PNT specifically. Did that answer your question, sir? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. And I, I, w I wanna throw out to Steve or Matt if, if you have anything to add or throw out on there, but again, I don't wanna put anybody on the spot. Well, I, I, I'd just like to give kudos to Chad for the work his team's doing there at Aberdeen Proving Ground in the uh, position navigation and timing space. And I think the lessons he's uh, learned there are now applying more broadly to the Army. The, um, For example, the optionally manned fighting vehicle, The uh, we're currently doing a, a government-managed uh, modular open system architecture for the next request for proposal that, that will enable industry to understand how they're going to compete for that. And we won't be vendor locked or have a uh, overly military unique solution that, uh, that causes the problems that you mentioned. So it's not easy, but it's where we need to be and, and uh, we're getting there. Excellent. All right, uh, we have a question from online. I'd like to take a moment just to address everyone that's, uh, that's watching virtually. Question from the audience um, about waste management solutions for their bases. I'm, I'm sure that's something you're you're looking into. Can you speak a little bit to some things like that that are a little bit more mundane? Uh, I can't speak specifically to what the answer is yes. Now I won't dig in too deeply to waste management because I'm not gonna try to lie to you and say that I know about the 15 waste management efforts that are going on, you know, in the state of Texas right now, because I don't. However, the, the way you phrase the question, as you said, some of the more mundane solutions, the mundane solutions, solving those things, free up so much time and resources and, and, and money to do the things that you see on the recruiting posters that we all do, that things like waste management, installation energy, all the things that just happen, those of us that are in the state of Texas, you know, we had, we had a power ice incident, you know, in uh, this winter and, and a whole lot of things that we all took for granted just kind of went away for about five days. If we can make if we can make those problems in an austere environment go away, we free up soldiers and leaders time to do what their mission is. Um, so we have got to get after things like waste management. We have got to get after those things that you may not think of as typical military mission sets. Um, a good friend of mine was a recruiter. Um, and he used to say that the only civilian job he couldn't find the equivalent of in the Army was actually a bartender. And he said that didn't really matter because everybody in the Army thinks they're an amateur bartender anyway. So that he, that he thought we had it all covered. So if you have a solution or something that, that can save us time and effort, that no problem is too small to solve. And if we can solve all those smaller problems and we can free up time, energy, and resources, to fill up some of the bigger problems like you just talked about, because I understood about 5% of what your answer was. So, And I don't know if uh, anybody else has anything to add to that. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and throw out that um, I completely agree with what uh, what Brian was just saying. And within the uh, the Army SBIR program, we're really looking to find where are those areas, right, where the Army certainly has an application, but the private sector is already working there and has, you know, unrivaled or unparalleled expertise that, again, we can tap into. So things like, you know, climate change, energy resiliency, uh, you know, Waste management could probably follow under that or, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, like I said. So not necessarily, you know, of course, the Army is invested in technologies that are, you know, incredibly Army centric and very specific to the Army. But as Brian indicated, it's how can we tap into private sector innovation that's already happening to solve some of our uh, more pervasive uh, operational uh, and sustainment, et cetera, challenges. Over. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Any questions in person before I keep going? All right, here. Microphone for you. Here you are. Thank you very much to all for this enlightening conversation. I have a question for Mr. Willis. For an innovative company developing new AI technology with dual use potential, who's looking to partner with the Army, potentially through SBIR, where do we start? How do we get in touch with you or your team to learn more and start to dialogue? Thank you. Great question. Thank you. That is a great question. So, so there's many, many different opportunities to, to, uh, to get engaged with us. You know, so I would, of course, start with uh, the Army SBI, our website, uh, armyserver.army.mil, which uh, we recently just updated uh, to be a bit more user friendly provide a much broader perspective on Army priorities that we're pursuing through the SBIR program. I'd also point you, of course, to the, you know, the AFC's website, Army Application Lab website. All of those different uh, websites have resources and opportunities where you can reach out not only to a, a mailbox that, you know, doesn't seemingly have a face behind it, but I promise you we, we all are, are all here. We do want to help. We do want to have those conversations. And honestly, within the server program, I know that it, I'll sound like a broken record, but we're also really trying to pivot the way that we describe our opportunity space so that it resonates or it's, it's less military speak S and, and resonates more explicitly with, uh, with you and with small businesses you know, across the ecosystem. So again, there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunities and we are trying to streamline it and make it easier uh, for small business to engage with us through mechanisms like that or uh, through like the X-Tech search prize competition, which we also run out of ASALT or the Rapid Capability and Critical Technologies Office. I won't steal Steve's uh, thunder, but I know they're executing a number of other initiatives really, again, aimed at how we can break down barriers between us, the Army, and, and you small businesses that are really, again, on the leading edge of, of technology innovations. Over. No, thanks. And I, we got time for one more quick got one. Time for one more. All right. Question from online for Mr. Hart. Can you discuss how you're using immersive VR technologies to assess, evaluate, predict human safety behavior? Um, predictive safety data would certainly be key in reducing safety incidents in the field and workplaces. And Steve, no pressure, but you got two minutes and eight seconds. <laughs> Okay, no great. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, currently it's, it's a big effort that we're, uh, first we have to collect the data and, and have the capability to do so and effectively manage the data. So we've got several efforts underway where we're uh, employing sensors on soldiers, both in a training environment and a research environment. And uh, we're able to fuse the sensor data and, and add additional information to what we were previously using uh, by, by having that additional VR data. Uh, some of the other programs that, uh, that we're looking at is the, the future of the, uh, the soldier is going to have a uh, like a heads-up display, and, and I think that's all um, being worked in a, uh, a rapid fashion. Uh, understanding how these uses will be uh, employed in the future is is a, uh, a challenge, and, and getting that to work properly in a combat environment. But I think we're getting there. We're making progress. Wow, Steve, as the, as the moderator, I had the kind of power I could have uh, given you an extra 30 seconds, but you, didn't, you answered it too quickly. Uh, um, 
So, but thanks for that. And I think we'll kind of go into wrap up mode of, uh, we'll go around the horn starting with Chad in the same order we started and just talk about an upcoming event um, that kind of links with either our organization or the, or the army priority that we discussed. Okay, thanks, Brian. So, so really for us uh, within PMP and T, uh, we're partnered with Brian's team on the Army, Army Application Lab. Um, so look out on the website, you know, in terms of for, for all, uh, potential opportunities there. Uh, those opportunities will reside on, you know, in terms of alternate PNT capabilities, complementary PNT capabilities, uh, both on a mounted, uh, mounted implementation and dismounted implementation. Uh, what, can we, what can we provide to the soldier um, in, in a degraded GPS environment? Right. So, so those will be some of the hot topics that we're looking for. Uh, also, uh, AJ, anti-jam capabilities, uh, both mounted and dismounted. Thank you very much. And uh, over to Matt Willis, please. All right. Yeah. So, so again, I, I really appreciate the, the discussion today. And um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight was, again, some of the changes that we're really making in the Army uh, SBIR program and that we're we're shifting the program from, you know, a construct that has a lot of random topics uh, to a more coherent model where we're actually bringing together stakeholders from Army Futures Command, uh, from the program executive offices, uh, from the user community, and centralizing them around certain technology ecosystems to really define what the needs are, uh, translate that into uh, more plain language topics and ensuring that as they go out, you know, we have a user and a transition opportunity in mind. So, so one of these areas does, you know, shockingly happen to be AIML for our program. And we're going to be releasing the first seven tranches of topics, or sorry, the first seven topics under, under AIML uh, next month, so in October. So if you uh, keep your eye on um, armycyber.army.mil, our, our website, uh, those opportunities will be out there shortly. Over. Thank you, Matt. And uh, over to Steve, please. Yeah, thanks. Just one more pitch for uh, one of the technology areas of interest across the Army's robotics and autonomous systems to help protect soldiers and uh, help with resupply, help with uh, lightening the burden on the soldier, uh, the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance aspects. We already have systems like this in the field, but I believe that I think we all believe that industry is, is uh, perhaps outpacing some of the, the use cases that the Army has. And uh, so keep, uh, if you're working in those areas, please keep an eye out. Uh, one of the events I like to speak about is the, uh, it's called the Astric event, and it is uh, sponsored by the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, our next iteration of problem statements as we work with program managers that uh, will pick up these prototypes and, and get work them into a program of record. Keep a lookout in about the, uh, the February timeframe and then the, the uh, competition white papers will, will follow not long after. Over. Thank you, Steve. And I will touch base real quickly on uh, what's gonna be called Army Vertex, which is gonna be an Army electrification event on 8, 9, and 10 February 2022. Um, and we'll have we'll have topic areas for each day. I believe it'll be here in the uh, cap factory, but that's still being worked out. And the purpose is to bring industry, academia, and DOD and the Army together to kind of lay out and continue the conversation of what the state of play is in, in the energy and electrification field, where the Army wants to go, what the outputs we were looking for, um, we'll bring in the OSD team to make sure that we're nested and because sometimes focus is different between operational energy and installation energy. Um, but sometimes we also pull those apart like they're mutually exclusive. And there's a lot of things that if it works in the, the remote environment of pick a place, it's probably going to work at Fort Hood, Texas or Fort Riley, Kansas. Um, there is a splash page forthcoming. So I got to get my plug in to follow AFC on uh, all social media as well as ASALT and these other organizations, because there's a lot of things that come out in more non-traditional ways. Um, something we're getting a little better at is keeping you informed without having to have a PhD in beta.sam and, and all that other stuff. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, your questions. They were uh, obviously very well thought out. And uh, we will give you back one minute and three seconds. I appreciate it. I'll take that time <laughs> back. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks.